resolved if Thank we you, invest Senator Polly. in better nutrition. Thank you, Senator Polly. The time has now expired. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President. Uh, I seek leave to make a statement concerning ministerial uh, arrangements. Leave is granted. Yes. Minister Farrell. No, there hasn't, hasn't been a coup. Uh, I advise changes to. <clears throat> I know. I know you missed me all last week. I heard. Uh, I heard the demand. For it. <laughs> Politics is full of surprises. Let me tell you. And I've. I've had more than. Sorry. I better get going. I advise changes. I advise changes to ministerial arrangements. Uh, Senator Wong, unfortunately, will be absent uh, from the Senate this week for personal reasons. In the absence, I am acting leader of the government in the Senate. In, in uh, thank you, Senator Wong. <laughs> in, <laughs> in Senator Wong's absence, ministers will represent portfolios at question time in accordance with the letter circulated to the pre president and party leaders and independent senators. Thank you, Senator Farrell. We'll move to question time. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Minister, prior to the election, the Prime Minister Albanese said this. He said, if I ever do make a mistake, I'll put my hand up, I'll own it, I'll take responsibility and I'll set about fixing it. Mr Albanese, un <laughs> without question, promised that Australian power bills will be coming down. The Labor Party promised, not just once, but 97 times before the election that Australians were going to see a reduction of $275 in their power bills. Minister, why won't Mr Albanese own up to his mistake, take responsibility for the broken promise and set about fixing it by delivering to Australians the $275 reduction they were promised they would receive? Thank you, Senator Reynolds. Uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, uh, Madam President, and thank uh, Senator Reynolds for her, um, her question. Um, <clears throat> Look, I, um, I think uh, we've discovered in uh, Prime Minister um, Albanese, one of Australia's great prime ministers. Um, uh, I'm, I'm smiling. I'm smiling. I'm, I'm smiling, Senator Henderson. I'm smiling. I'm so, smiling, Senator Henderson, because I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Um, not just for. Um, no, I'm, I'm so happy. I'm so, I'm, so, I'm so happy that Australia has finally got a really decent Prime Minister. Uh, somebody, somebody, somebody who really genuinely understands uh, the issues facing um, Australian consumers. And of course, higher electricity prices is, is one of them. And what, what, what was one of the first things that the new Prime Minister did on taking office. He inherited, he inherited this mess. He inherited this 10 years of neglect. He inherited 10 years of neglect on the part of the former government. And what did he seek to do? Well, he, he sought to put downward pressure on electricity prices. He, he saw, he saw, he saw, he saw as quickly as he could, he, he, he saw as quickly as he could what your 10 years of neglect had done to electricity prices. And so what did he do? He, he introduced a cap. He introduced a cap on gas prices and coal prices to push that pressure down. Now, he, can't, he couldn't fix... He can't fix every single problem that you've created. Uh, thank I've... you, Minister. Your time has expired. Oh, Senator Reynolds, first supplementary. Uh, thank you very much, um, President. Um, I'm sure we're all very happy that you're happy, but I don't think the Australians are very happy at the uh, broken promises. So my supplementary question is this. The Prime Minister also promised the Australian people on the 2nd of May 2022 that the Labor Party had no intention to make any changes to superannuation. But we now know that one in ten Australians will be affected by the change they announced. 
Minister, when will you announce that the government has broken its promise in relation to superannuation? Uh, Minister Farrell. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator um, uh, Reynolds for her supplementary question. It doesn't appear to have been a supplementary question about about electricity. No, I'm, simp I'm simply saying I don't. Let Order me finish. I mean, you've missed Order me. You missed left. me all of last week. Here I am, here to answer your questions, and you won't let me answer those questions. Now, now, now. I'm sorry. Am I Order there? on okay. my left and my right, Minister Farrell. Please continue. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, protection, uh, President. Um, now, um, we've uh, we've made very clear what our position on superannuation is. Um, the figure that you mentioned, uh, Senator Reynolds, is a figure way into the uh, into the future the reality is that the only people the only Thank people you, Minister. your time for answering has expired senator reynolds second supplementary well two out of two questions not answered on uh, broken promises and no wonder my second supplementary question to the minister is that the prime minister also promised to lower the cost of pbs medicines but guess what another broken promise but the government has removed, for example, life-changing drugs from the PBS, one of which is now being relied on by 15,000 Australians who suffer from type 1 diabetes. Now, despite the minister doing an embarrassing backflip uh, on Friday, now listing it until October, uh, thank you, what Senator shame. Reynolds, your time has expired. Minister Farrell. Well done. Great job. Order. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, President, and uh, thank you, um, thank you, um, uh, Senator uh, Reynolds, um, for for your question. Um, uh, well, I'm also a diabetic, and uh, I uh, very much appreciate uh, the um, the way in which the uh, PBS assists uh, me with my uh, my particular products that uh, that uh, I am required to uh, to use. Um, uh, uh, Minister we have Farrell, please resume your seat. Uh, Senator Reynolds. Thank you. A question of relevance. This was about what the minister was going to do for yet another broken promise on the uh, PBS. Thank you, Senator Reynolds. And it's not about thank his you, own personal Senator medical Reynolds. situation. Senator Reynolds, there was so much preamble to that question that your supplementary that there wasn't actually a question, it was a statement. Um, and believe that the uh, I've is this a secondary point of order? Respect. Uh, while, yes, it is a sad story of a broken uh, promise, Senator it was Reynolds, not about what is Senator the point Farrell's of order? health. Thank you. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. And uh, the particular drug mm -hmm. I think you mentioned, is it uh, Fiasp? Fiasp? Yeah. OK. It's a fast-acting mm -hmm. insulin drug for, uh, for diabetes. Um, Minister Butler, as office was made aware, on the 22nd of February in 2023, of uh, Novo Nordisk's intention to. Uh, please, you've asked a question. I'm directly answering the question, and then you're talking the whole way uh, through thank the you, answer. The time for and I don't get a chance expired. to answer the question. Senator Giacconi. Uh, Senator Giacconi, I've called you. Thank you very much, President. Sorry for all that ruckus. I didn't actually hear you, you calling me, but thank you very much. But given that uh, Senator Farrell is doing a fine job, my question is also to Senator Farrell, uh, as the acting leader of the government here in the Senate and representing the Foreign Affairs Minister. Senator Farrell, how will the AUKUS submarine acquisition make Australia and our region a much safer and stronger part in this part of the world? Senator Farrell, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator Ciccone for his question. I know he has a a deep interest in uh, Australian uh, security uh, matters. Um, the AUKUS uh, optimal pathway announced last week is an unprecedented investment in our national power. The acquisition of nuclear-powered submarines will be uh, the single greatest defence capability acquisition in our history. I'll repeat that. It's the single greatest um, uh, defence um, investment in our history. Our nuclear-powered submarines uh, will be 
an Australian sovereign capable, uh, commanded by uh, the Royal Australian Navy and sustained by Australian shipyards. Uh, senators uh, have heard uh, members of the government speak of how our region is at the centre of a world that is uh, being reshaped, of how we face our most challenging circumstances uh, since uh, the uh, Second World War. AUKUS is one element of uh, Australia's approach to addressing this strategic environment and contributing to strategic balance in our region. I hope senators uh, would agree that uh, Australia has a responsibility to contribute to a regional balance in capability that helps underpin uh, regional stability. We want to ensure that no state will ever conclude the benefits of conflict outweigh the risks. And so nuclear-powered submarines are part of our contribution to this aim by transforming our ability to deter or respond to any future threats. As part of our uh, contribution to uh, the regional balance, these submarines add to a collective security in a region where no country dominates and no country is dominated. Thank you, Senator yeah. Farrell. Uh, Minister, uh, Senator Giacconi, first supplementary. Thank you very much, President. And uh, with my uh, first supplementary, um, I do ask Senator Farrell, how will the AUKUS submarine acquisition contribute to the Australian economy? Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And uh, once again, thank uh, Senator Ciccone for his uh, question. Order. The scale, Order. The scale partnership. Order. Order. The scale partnership. Order. The scale, partnership and commitment of this deal are unmatched. Governments, businesses and communities in all three countries are invested in this being a success for generations to come. AUKUS will create around uh, 20,000 direct jobs over the next uh, 30 years. My state, in particular South Australia, will be the home of the Australian nuclear-powered submarine construction. Labor has always stood up for South Australian shipbuilders and now we're delivering with an historic investment. Up to 4,000 workers will design and build the infrastructure for the submarine construction yard at Osborne. A further 4,000 to 5,500 direct jobs are expected to build nuclear-powered submarines in South Australia when the program reaches Thank you, its Minister. peak. The time for answering has expired. Senator Giacconi, second supplementary. Thank you very much, President, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. Minister, um, how will the Australia maintain its world-class non-proliferation credentials under the AUKUS submarine acquisition? Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam President, and once again thank uh, Senator Ciccone for his question. Uh, Labor has a proud history of non-proliferation and disarmament advocacy and we uh, are resolutely committed to the Treaty of uh, Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. We are working openly and transparently with the International Atomic Energy Agency to, to develop a robust non-proliferation -prol approach to underpin our program. And let me be clear, Australia will never seek to acquire nuclear weapons. Our AUKUS partners recognise Australia's obligations under international law including the Treaty of uh, Rarotonga. And naval nuclear propulsion is consistent with those obligations. Finally, I note that the uh, United States Defence uh, Secretary Austin has confirmed submarines visiting Australia on rotation will be conventionally armed. Thank you, Minister Farrell. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. Is Mike Hurst, former CEO of Bendigo Bank, correct when he said recently that taxing unrealised gains is going to provide cash flow problems for people who might not be earning a lot of income but have assets? Can you guarantee that no farmer will have to sell any part of their farm to pay their superannuation tax bill? Minister Farrell. <coughs> Thank you, uh, President. And, um, uh, Thank you, um, uh, thank you, uh, Senator Colbeck, for his uh, his question. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't get the opportunity in the previous uh, question to sort of uh, point out uh, just um, how small the impact of our super changes is going to be. And I think it's worth it's worth um, repeating uh, that um, 
of uh, percent of uh, superannuation recipients uh, are not going to be the subject of this uh, of this change. Um, but in terms of the issue that you've just raised, in terms of unrealised gains. Uh, the simplest and uh, least uh, cost approach is to apply the tax on the growth of an individual's balance over the year. This approach, recommended by Treasury, included assessing unrealised capital gains. Uh, this approach uh, strikes, we believe, the right balance between uh, simplicity and ensuring uh, that the tax uh, can be applied across the, uh, the systems. Uh, trustees already calculate the value of their fund each year and submit that to the tax office, um, which will enable the ATO uh, to... Um, Minister, please resume your seat. Senator Colbeck. Uh, thanks, President. Um, on relevance, it would be nice if uh, the minister did at least use the word farmer, because the question was about whether a farmer might have to sell part of their um, farm. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Um, the minister is being relevant to the question. Minister Farrell, please continue. President, um, well, in terms of um, the question of whether farmers uh, need to liquidate the family farm in, uh, say, a uh, SMS uh, um, fund to pay the tax liability, under our superannuation law, funds should have some liquid assets to meet any additional tax liabilities and uh, to meet their running costs. Uh, this is no different. There are a range of... Uh, well, I do, have some, I do have some idea about how to run a small business, uh, <coughs> Senator thank McGrath. You, Minister I do have some ex uh, practical you, experience Order. in that matter. Order. Yeah. The time for answering has expired. Senator Colbeck, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Under Labor's new super, super tax, if a farmer with a self-managed super fund sees the paper value if, if a farmer with a self-managed super fund sees the paper value of her farm self-managed super fund fluctuate above and below the $3 million threshold across a number of years, will those gains be subject to the 30 per cent tax rate each time? Thank you. I said it a feral minister. Farrell. Oh, sorry. Thank you, Senator Colbeck. Minister Farrell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, President. Well, um, um, in terms of um, answering uh, that question and the previous question, of course, there are a range of uh, cash flow requirements uh, within uh, an SMF, uh, not uh, just uh, tax liabilities, which uh, trustees uh, are required to consider. This includes uh, examples, accounting and administration costs, investment fees and costs associated with maintaining real assets such as property. Now, I think in terms of putting your question into um, some perspective, uh, Senator um, Colbeck, I think it's, I think it's uh, worth pointing out that only 0.2% uh, uh, of um, SMSFs have 100% um, of their Minister assets. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, President. A question on uh, point of order, I should say, on direct relevance. The question asked by Senator Colbeck in this case went particularly to the impact of thresholds and those funds operating at or close to the threshold, potentially moving up and down, uh, above and below that threshold. Uh, Senator Farrell has had 49 seconds. He's only got 11 seconds left. He hasn't Thank come you. close to the issue of the Senator, threshold. Senator Birmingham, the question was about um, self-managed funds, um, but I will remind uh, Senator Farrell of the entirety of the question. Minister. Thank you, Thank you uh, President. Well, look, um, I'm, I was trying um, to put the issue in some perspective, and particularly so as to not frighten frighten those farmers Thank who you, do Minister Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Colbeck, second supplementary. Thank you, President. How, how will you ensure that farmers, small business owners and other self-funded retirees are not subject to double taxation under your new super tax? Uh, Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, Madam President. Well, the point I was trying to make before is that um, obviously, the opposition think there's some political advantage in running a scare campaign. Um, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Senator Rustin. 
facts. Um, the minister has clearly used the entire time um, not Senator to answer Rustin. the question. Could Senator you direct Rustin. him to answering Senator the question? Rustin, if you're calling a point of order on relevance, it is on the question before the chair, and that is the second supplementary. The minister's got to his feet. Um, I will listen closely, and if he's not relevant, I will remind him uh, of the question. Minister. With due res Thank you, uh, President. Um, but with due respect to um, Senator uh, Rustin, um, just because you don't like the way in which, just just in, just because you don't like the way I answer the question, doesn't mean uh, that um, what I'm saying is not relevant for the question. And um, on this on this on this very point, the point I'm trying to make is a simple one. There is no point trying to scare. Uh, farmers or other small business people with a scare with a scare campaign that bears no relevance to the facts. It bears no relevance um, to the Minister facts. Minister Farrell, um, thank you, Senator Birmingham. Direct relevance again, President. Uh, this minister is seeking to speak constantly in generalisations when a specific question has been asked. If he's worried about putting people's uh, minds at ease, you. perhaps he should be able to answer thank the specific you. questions to put their minds at ease. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. Yeah. Uh, Minister Farrell, order. Minister Farrell, I will remind you of the question and, and the need to be relevant. Thank you. Just, just on the question of double taxation, of course, um, one of the things to note about this new change is that it doesn't come into effect for Thank a couple you, of Minister, years, the and there's time plenty of time to consult. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, thank you, President. My question is directed to the Honourable Don Farrell, in his capacity representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs and the Minister for Defence. Since becoming Foreign Minister, Senator Wong has repeatedly stated that re-engaging with China on a diplomatic level is the first step to stabilising the two countries' relationship. China last week responded to the announcement about the $368 billion nuclear-powered submarine deal, saying the US, UK and Australia are completely disregarding the concerns of the international community and, quote, walking further and further down the path of error and danger. Isn't it true that whatever efforts your government was making to repair relations with China through diplomatic means, they have now been fundamentally sabotaged by this hawkish push from defence and the US and UK arms industries? Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Minister Farrell. <clears throat> thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank uh, Senator uh, Shoebridge for his, uh, his question. Um, uh, look, I don't agree with your um, assertion there, uh, Senator. And, um, I'll make a couple of points, um, and I made this point uh, uh, on Sky TV yesterday. Uh, I think, uh, I think, I think, uh, I think uh, Senator uh, Wong is uh, shaping up to be one of the finest foreign ministers that we've had uh, in this country, uh, certainly in my lifetime. Uh, and uh, I think all of the things that she's done, not just in the Pacific, not just. Uh, may be provocative, but I think it's true, and uh, most of my colleagues here would uh, Order. see them nodding. Order. Uh, she, Order. Um, she's uh, not only what she's been doing in the uh, Pacific, in the uh, in the Asian region, but what she has been doing uh, in in terms of China. I mean, I might remind you that two days before Christmas, when most of us would have been spending our time uh, with our, our families preparing for uh, Christmas Day, uh, Senator Wong uh, flew up, to, flew up to, uh, to China to meet again with her equivalent. And that, that, meeting, that, meeting, that meeting was the precursor to a meeting that I had a couple of weeks ago with my equivalent to try and stabilise and uh, normalise the relationship with, uh, with China. Um, there's nothing. There's nothing Senator that I've Shoebridge. heard. There's nothing of, I've heard uh, that would suggest anything other than this process of stabilisation is well on its uh, well on its way. I mean, you may read everything in uh, the Chinese newspapers, but uh, I hear I hear and believe all of those things. Um, well, no, I don't uh, live on a thank rock. Thank you, Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Shoebridge, first supplementary. A senior Indone Indonesian official says the country's sea lanes should not be used by Australian nuclear-propelled submarines because, quote, AUKUS was created for fighting. Similar concerns have been expressed by Malaysia. Given the negative response from our regional neighbours to the AUKUS submarine deal, can you now acknowledge 
that it marks the official demotion of Australian diplomacy and the bypassing of Senator Wong's office for an international posture driven by defence hawks and the US and UK arms industries. Thank you, Senator Shoebridge. Um, Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, well, I, I, again, I completely reject uh, the assertion uh, and the underlying assumptions in your, uh, your, quest, your question. Uh, I, saw, I, saw, I saw Senator uh, Wong just about every day last week um, out there explaining to the Australian people uh, what the AUKUS arrangements means for um, not only her own state, of course, which is a very significant development, but for the country uh, and, the, uh, and the region. And I would have said that, um, uh, on balance, the um, response, for instance, of the Indonesians, which you've referred to, was a very uh, balanced response to what was a sensible decision in our national interest. Um, we have to, the, most, the, the most important job of any federal government is to ensure the safety and the security of its, peop uh, of its people. Thank you, and Minister. The time for answering has expired. Senator Shoebridge, sec oh, order. Order. Senator Shoebridge, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Thank you, Pete. Thank you, Pete. T today marks 20 years since the invasion of Iraq. Minister, do you accept? that the $368-plus billion orca submarine deal and its handcuffing of our largest military program ever to the United States military and their future war-making shows we've learnt nothing from the disaster of Iraq. Nothing. Thank you, Senator Shebridge. Minister Farrell. Um, look, again, I, uh, I, reject the, uh, I reject completely the, the suggested link between AUKUS and uh, and the events in uh, Iraq. I think I'd, 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 I'd point out. I'd point out that had we had, had we had Senator a Labor Wish government, Wilson. had we had a Labor government in office at the time that the decisions were made in respect to Iraq, Australia, Australia would not have joined. Senator Farrell, uh, that... could you resume your seat, please? Sorry, uh, Senator Shoebridge, I've called you at least three times. You've asked your question. Now allow the minister to respond. Minister, please continue. <coughs> Thank you, um, President. Um, my point is simply this, that there, there is no link between AUKUS and uh, what happened in Iraq. And had a Labor government been in office, had a Labor government, had a late, well, the Labor Party under Simon Crean, the Labor Party Minister under Simon Farrell, Crean. Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. And again, Senator Wish Wilson, I've called you on numerous occasions. The question's been asked. Allow the minister to answer. Minister Farrell, please continue. They ask the questions, uh, President, and then they don't like the answers. But um, the truth, the truth of what happened under the Iraq Thank you, Minister. Award. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister for Finance and the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, last week the Albanese government announced the details of the optimal pathway for the AUKUS Pact between Australia, the United States and the United Kingdom. Can the minister outline to the Senate how this agreement will create Australian jobs? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith for the question. Uh, this was a really historic announcement and a unique opportunity for jobs and skills right here in Australia. It will create an entirely new workforce sector, driving skills, training and employment opportunities which will benefit the national economy for generations. It's a whole of nation effort that will deliver nation changing op opportunities, including around 20,000 direct high skilled, high paid jobs, including technicians, engineers, scientists and project managers. This means jobs right across Australia, but also in the good Senator Smith's uh, home state of South Australia and indeed Western Australia. In South Australia, where I had the honour to visit last week with Senator Wong, this project will mean up to 4,000 workers will be employed to design and build the infrastructure at the submarine construction yard in Osborne at its peak, and a further 4,000 to 5,500 direct jobs are expected to be created to build the nuclear-powered submarines in South Australia when the program reaches its peak in 20 to 30 years, almost double the workforce that had been forecast for the attack class program. 
In Western Australia, the expansion of HMAS Stirling to support the infrastructure required for nuclear-powered submarines is expected to create around 3,000 direct jobs over the decade, and an additional 500 direct jobs are expected to be created to sustain the submarine rotational force west over the period 2027 to 2032. We need to get moving on these investment, investments, not just for our national security, but investing in the future of defence and also the future of our economy and the skills and jobs that come with it. This is a big investment and we've been up front with the Australian people about the substantial pressures on the budget. Defence is one of the big five fastest growing areas of spending, along with NDIS, aged care, health care and the cost of servicing the trillion do dollars Thank of Minister, liberal the debt. The time for answering has expired. Senator Smith, first supplementary. Minister, how will this agreement benefit not just Australian workers but also Australian companies? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, President. I thank Senator Smith again for her advocacy, in particular in relation to um, her, the state of South Australia. Last week, when I was visiting um, South Australia uh, out at, with a and at Osborne, uh, we announced the Sovereign Submarine Partnership, which will be the architecture that is used to guide and set uh, how these submarines will be built. This agreement will provide opportunity to select the partners, but also ensure that max to maximise the opportunities for Australian businesses to participate in these new uh, arrangements. This is, a com this is complementary to our plans for a future made in Australia and the Buy Australian plan, which is about leveraging the purchasing power of the Commonwealth to increase opportunities for Australian workers and businesses. We're estimating that $6 billion will be invested in Australian industry and workforce, a transformational investment which will remake Australia and accelerate growth in the same way that large projects like Snowy did uh, all those years ago. Thank you, Minister. Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you, Minister, and you're welcome in South Australia any time. Um, can you tell us how the creation of new jobs and opportunities for Australian businesses will benefit the Australian economy? Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Well, yes, it will transform our economy for a new era. A whole generation of workers will be trained in the latest engineering, technology and building skills. There will be significant benefits across the nation through increased economic activity and job creation, which will start immediately and grow over time as we develop a whole new industry and new supports for that industry. It's all part of our economic plan to undertake investments to build the capability of our people and expand the productive ca capacity of our economy for a new era. I've already mentioned the Future Made in Australia plans and the Buy Australian Plan policy. We also have the National Reconstruction Fund, obviously, uh, which would be Hopefully. good to pass the legislation Hopefully. that uh, supports that. Policies for free, free Fee TAFE, Jobs and Skills Australia and Acting on Climate Change. All of these policies are designed to grow the economy, you know boost productivity and upskill Australians, and the AUKUS investment is another vital part of our economic plan going to the future. Thank you, Minister. Senator Hanson. Order. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Farrell. The updated strategic direction statement for the National Indigenous Australians Agency that falls under the portfolio of Prime Minister and Cabinet says it provides advice on whole of government priorities for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as well as leading and coordinating the implementation of Australia's Closing the Gap targets in partnership with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Given we have the NIAA, why does the government contend we need a voice to parliament in the constitution? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, President, and I thank uh, Senator Hanson for her question. <clears throat> um, I think the first um, and primary um, answer to that question is that uh, at the last election, um, the uh, Labor Party uh, listen to um, those people who had uh, ag advocated on behalf of the uh, Uluru uh, Statement from the Heart, people like my very good friend here, uh, Patrick uh, uh, Dodson, um, like uh, Jana uh, Stewart over there, amongst uh, very, very many other um, significant members of the Labor Party, uh, to try and deal with the I issue of uh, Indigenous uh, recognition uh, through a voice to the Australian Parliament. Um, that process wasn't uh, developed overnight. It took place over a long period of time, 
Uh, and we took, we took, we took that, we took that, we took that proposition to the um, Australian people at the last election, and the Australian people uh, made a decision about who they wanted to govern this country. Uh, and uh, as soon as we got into uh, government, because they elected, they elected us, they elected us uh, as the government, we under. Un under undertook to implement the promise that we had taken. You talk about um, uh, <coughs> promises. Well, we took we took a promise. We took a promise. We took a promise um, to the Australian people, and we have implemented. Order. We have sought Order. to implement that uh, that problem. I have to say, I have been disappointed in uh, the opposition um, in their approach so far to. Um, Simple things like the machinery bill, the machinery bill uh, that could start the process of uh, implementing. Uh, thank you, Minister the Farrell. The time for answering has expired. Senator Hanson, first supplementary. The NIAA priorities this year include closing the gaps, implementing the Uluru Statement, developing a new jobs program, delivering First Nations justice, whatever that means, and more. It has also budgeted $31 million to deliver local and regional voice implementation despite the Prime Minister saying he would not fund the yes or no cases in the coming referendum. Will the Minister please inform the Senate about the NIAA's total budget for 2022-23? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, um, thank you uh, President, and thank uh, uh, um, Senator Hanson, again for her uh, her, her question. Um, I think you're conflating a couple of issues. Um, to be honest uh, with you, um, Senator uh, Senator Hanson. Um, um, no, well, it's not patronising. It's simply a statement uh, statement of fact. Um, Senator Hanson has has asked a question, and I'm I'm trying to uh, answer that uh, question uh, for for her. Um, those those. That information that uh, you are um, requesting uh, will, of course, be published in uh, in due course as part of uh, uh, of part of the relevant uh, budget uh, budget papers. But um, the issue of um, the referendum um, to implement the voice. Um, Indigenous recognition. Thank you, voice Minister Farrell. To... The time for uh, answering has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. It doesn't surprise me. No answer. And you don't even know the budget papers are already out. Actually, the NIAA is almost four and a half billion dollars. It employs more than 1,300 people, and its remit appears to be largely the same as the government's somewhat vague intentions for the voice. That's truth-telling for you. Will the minister please explain why Australians should not believe the government's ulterior motive in implementing the Uluru Statement is to establish an independent, sovereign black nation in Australia? Yeah! Uh, order, Senator Thorpe. Senator Thorpe, order. Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, order. Well, Senator Hanson, I completely reject your proposition. Um, this, this is an issue um, that, um, as I said, the Labor Party took to the last election, uh, and we are seeking to implement um, Indigenous rec recognition through a voice to parliament, and we're seeking to do it um, in an open, honest and transparent way. Just to give you one example, um, originally there wasn't going to be a yes or a no case uh, pamphlet, um, and we we um, were requested to do that by the opposition, and we agreed. And as part of that process, Senator Hanson, because you are a member of Parliament, and because of the way in which that document is going to be prepared, you yourself will have an opportunity to explain to the Australian people. What, 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 what I, whether you're supporting yes or no, I think I can guess. Uh, Minister you're, Farrell, you're... time for answering has expired. Thank you. Senator Rennick. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Order. Senator Farrell. AEMO explicitly named regulatory approvals, price intervention and a mandatory code of conduct as key uncertainties impacting project timelines and likelihood of completion. 
Minister, will you admit that the interventions of your government are suppressing and damaging investment in new gas projects? Thank you, Senator Rennick. Minister Farrell. Um, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank you, uh, Senator uh, Rennick, for this uh, rare, rare question. Um, no, the short answer is no uh, to that. Um, looking, look all around the world, um, Senator, as to what the consequences of this terrible war between uh, Russia and Ukraine has done to gas prices, to gas, pr to gas prices, um, right, Order right, on my right left. around, Order. right around. Order, Minister Farrell, please continue. Um, all around the world, um, governments um, uh, are dealing with this issue of rising uh, electricity uh, prices. Um, all around the world, governments have had to deal with the way of trying to put downward pressure uh, on those prices. Um, what, what we have done, what, 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 well, 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 order, order, all. All uh, what? Senator, Minister Farrell, please resume your seat. Order on my left and right. Order. Minister, please continue. I mean, what, what are the Europeans doing? What are the Europeans doing at the moment? What are the Europeans doing? They're putting, they're putting, they're putting caps, they're putting caps on, on gas prices. Is anybody saying, is anybody in, in Europe saying, oh, this is going to, this is going to, uh, result for, to, for um, disinvestment in, in gas? No, they're not saying that. In fact, in fact, what they're doing, what they're doing, what they're doing is increasing, increasing their investment uh, in this area. And of course, my belief, my, my belief is that that's 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 where. Well, well, I'm happy to talk to you, uh, Senator Canavan, about gas gas prices and. Uh, uh, the importance, the importance of investment in uh, uh, in gas in this uh, Thank you, Minister. in this country. Time for answering has expired. Senator Rennick, first supplementary. Uh, when will the Albanese government mandatory code of conduct be finalised? Uh, Minister Farrell. Order. I've called the minister, Minister Farrell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well. Um, un unlike the former government, who seemed to be unable to come up with any sensible plan in respect of uh, gas prices, coal prices, electricity prices, climate change, this this government this government uh, has has got a plan, uh, and we are working through that plan as uh, as we speak. We're working through. We're working through that plan as we speak, and um, um, we've got um, a number of excellent ministers, like Minister uh, um, uh, Minister Farrell. Please resume your seat, Senator Rennick. Point of order, Chair. I asked when the mandatory code of conduct yep. will be completed, um, not when you are working through you, it. Thank you, Senator Rennick. I will direct the minister to the questions, Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, um, Madam President, and. Uh, um, look, we uh, we've dealt. We've, we're dealing with the issue. We're putting downward pressure, downward pressure on the electricity system, and we we are consulting as we should. We're Thank consulting you, Minister as Farrell. We the time for answering has expired. Uh, Senator Rennick, second supplementary. Labor has broken its promise to lower power bills by $275. Given the simple economic fact that price controls do not increase supply, what do you have to say to Australians who may also lose power and heating this year because of Labor's failed energy policies? Is the government lowering bills by simply not having any power or gas to buy? Thank you, Senator Rennick. Minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and uh, thank, uh, thank the Senator for his uh, supplementary question. Uh, this government has made it very clear that we continue to support the gas uh, industry in this uh, in this country. Well, well, um, they may not they may not say that to you, uh, uh, Senator, but they they say that to me, and I have uh, regular discussions uh, with many of the major uh, gas uh, companies in in this uh, in this country. 
Um, and look, they they understand. They understand the pressure. They understand. They understand the pressure that Australian consumers and Australian businesses are under as a result of your Order failure on my left. to. Senator Cash. They understand. They understand. They understand the pressure uh, Minister that Farrell, they are please under. Resume your seat. Minister Farrell, please resume. Order on my left. Minister, please continue. Thank you. Is that the question you would have chosen, Jerry? Um, <laughs> look. Look, look, these issues, Minister, these issues the are, are being has dealt expired. with. Thank you. Uh, Senator McKim. Thanks, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Minister, you and other members of your government consistently say that it is the financial position you inherited which is the reason you can't provide more support for Australians getting smashed by the cost of living crisis. Yet last week, your government delighted US and British weapons manufacturers by signing up to a $368 billion deal for nuclear-powered submarines. Minister, how are you ever going to look Australians in the eye again and tell them that you can't afford to put dental and mental health into Medicare, that you can't afford to raise the rate of income support and that you can't afford to wipe student debt when you are prepared to splash $368 billion on the AUKUS subs. Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, and I thank uh, Senator McKim for the question. Uh, and as um, senators will know, one of the, um, the main job of a federal government is to keep our citizens safe. Uh, and this investment in our national security is important Correct. on its own, uh, but it also has significant economic benefits across the country as well. In terms of, in terms of the impact, the question goes to the impact on the budget. So, um, as, as people will be aware, we've uh, forecasted over the forward estimates the impact will be in the order of $9 billion, of which $6 billion sits in the forward estimates as provision uh, for the attack class, uh, and that the additional um, costs over the forward estimates uh, will be met um, from within uh, Defence's existing uh, funding arrangements. Over the medium term, we are looking at costs in the order of 50 to 58 billion, and beyond that, um, looking at 0.1, around 0.15 percent uh, of GDP, 0.15 percent of GDP over uh, into the next uh, 20, 30 years. Uh, I would say that this investment is also um, just under 10 per cent of the investment that we make overall into defence. Uh, it is an important uh, arrangement and an important agreement, but I would also say that that doesn't mean that those other areas of priority within the budget uh, don't get the attention of the government as well. And as you know, we've made investments into key social uh, policy areas like childcare, like making medicines cheaper, like investing in free free fee TAFE, uh, and the budget will also have a significant investment in cost of living around energy bills. And we've also got the work that's com coming our way from um, the Economic Inclusion Advisory Board that will also uh, inform the government in its decision making. But it's not an either or. We have to do all of these things. Uh, thank you, Minister. Um, were you going to make a point of order, Senator McKim? Or are you oh, saying... no, I wasn't. I was okay. uh, simply rising okay. slightly precipitously. Okay. Uh, right. President... So, um, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Uh, Minister, Labor's stage three tax cuts will cost even more than Labor's nuclear submarines. Three quarters of the benefit of the stage three tax cuts will go to the top 20 per cent of income earners. Meanwhile, women in their 60s are having to sleep on their friends' couches. Is this what the Prime Minister meant when he said that Labor would leave no one behind? Thank you, Senator McKim. Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you, uh, President, and I thank Senator McKim for his ongoing interest in stage three tax cuts. Um, as the senator will know, our policy on these tax cuts hasn't changed, and our focus on tax reform is in the area of ensuring multinationals pay their fair share of tax 
and um, some of the, the change that we've recently announced around superannuation for high balance accounts. I would say again, we have important policies that go to the point. I'm not dismissing the point that Senator McKim raises about other areas of pressing uh, pressure and need in the budget, including for uh, women and women's housing. It is, um, it is a real priority, and that's why we really like to see this Senate pass the Housing Australia Future Fund in this fortnight so that we could make sure that some of the allocations to that go absolutely and specifically to that demographic group. Thank you, Minister. Senator McKim, second supplementary. Thanks, President. Minister, we hear a lot from the Treasurer about relief, repair, and restraint, but the stage three tax cuts and the submarines are none of those things. Given your cash splash on weapons and the wealthy and your avoidance of serious tax reform, what excuse will you lose will you use when you hand down your austerity budget in May? Thank you, Senator Kim. Uh, Minister Gallagher. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President. I thank Senator McKim for uh, his his question and um, for uh, I, I well Senator McKim can describe a budget that hasn't been handed down or finalised in the in the terms with which he chooses. But um, this budget is an important budget in terms of uh, the relief that we need to offer for cost of living. I've gone through the forward estimates impact of um, the defence arrangements of AUKUS to make sure that um, that isn't an additional cost that's being met from within the Ford estimates. Um, in this high inflation environment, there is also a responsibility to not be adding to or fueling inflation. So that means the decisions we take have to be very careful. They have to be about investing in the productive side of our economy, not making the inflation challenge harder, um, but making sure that we are providing sensible and affordable cost of living relief where we can. And we think we will get those. There's still some, a lot of decisions to be made, but the budget will be determined in that light. Thank you, Minister. Um, Senator White. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Skills and Training, Senator Watt. Can the Minister update the Senate on how the Albanese Labor government's AUKUS submarine program skill, Skills and Training Academy will help to upskill and attract the workforce to support and build the capabilities of Australia's world-leading defence industry? Thank you, Senator White. M Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White, who I know has had a lifelong interest and dedication to raising skills and training within our community. Last week, the Prime Minister announced Australia's optimal pathway to acquire conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines. In addition to strengthening Australia's national security, this announcement will build a future made in Australia by Australians with record investments in defence, skills, jobs and infrastructure. As Senator Gallagher has stated, the program will create around 20,000 direct jobs over the next 30 years across industry, the Australian Defence Force and the Australian Public Service, including trades workers, operators, technicians, engineers, scientists, submariners and project managers. And at its peak, building and sustaining nuclear-powered submarines in Australia will create up to 8,500 direct jobs in the industrial workforce. It's a decision that means many, many jobs uh, for workers right around the country, in particular in the states of South and West Australia. And on Wednesday, the Commonwealth and South Australian governments signed a cooperation agreement outlining our respective governments' commitment to supporting the construction of Australia's next generation conventionally armed nuclear-powered submarines in Adelaide. As part of the agreement, the Albanese government and South Australia will work towards the construction, establishment and operation of a skills and training academy campus in South Australia. The academy will be a dedicated hub to attract, grow, develop and qualify the shipbuilding workforce to meet current and future demands and provide opportunities for continuous development of the existing workforce. The academy will support the entire shipbuilding workforce providing hands-on trades training and classroom-based professional development backed by cutting-edge technology and modern facilities. Uh, this will be a whole-of-nation initiative and it will incorporate multiple locations to deliver training where it's needed, with the central campus being built in South Thank Australia. Thank you, Senator Watt. Um, Senator White, first supplementary. Uh, can the minister explain how the new academy will work hand-in-glove with education and training providers and state and territory governments to drive Australia's workforce and skills development? Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator White. 
the new Skills and Training Academy will be delivered working in lockstep with state and territory governments, unions, universities, education and training providers and the scientific and technical sectors and will be vital to supporting the capabilities of Australia's world-leading defence industry. Importantly, the Academy will be responsive, connected to and informed by Australian industry. This will be an Academy that strengthens Australia's sovereign capabilities by growing our industrial workforce, ensuring that industry has the people and skills it needs to realise emerging opportunities across the shipbuilding economy. The Albanese Labor government has a strong record of working hand in glove with state and territory governments when it comes to skills development. In addition to the announcement of the new academy, the Albanese Labor government has also signed landmark skills agreements with every state and territory government, and that of course includes the delivery of 180,000 fee-free TAFE and VET places nationwide in 2023, along with a range of other Thank initiatives. Thank you, Minister. Senator White, second supplementary. What steps has the Albanese Labor government already taken to help upskill Australians to harness these jobs and opportunities of the future? Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Well, the Albanese Labor government understands the life-changing benefits of vocational education and training to create good, secure jobs and to address skill shortages. Unlike we saw from the, the former government cutting TAFE, cutting training opportunities until it was all too late, the Albanese Labor government is serious about building the skills of our workforce so that the people have the opportunity to take on the jobs of the future. Australia's vocational education and training sector already contributes significantly to our naval shipbuilding and sustainment sector, providing diverse skills requirements ranging from complex engineering and design roles, project management and logistics roles, through to highly advanced technician and trade roles. And our delivery of 180,000 fee-free TAFE and VET places in 2023 is further supporting this. The Albanese Labor government is investing in our greatest resource, our people. Our fee-free TAFE places will provide training opportunities, particularly focusing on priority groups, increase workforce participation and address skills uh, thank gaps you, in the economy. Time for answering has expired. Senator Davey. Thank you very much. My question is to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry and Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Murray Watt. Minister, what assets does the Commonwealth have which could be used to help remove dead fish from the Darling River at Menindee? Has the Commonwealth offered any of these resources to help the New South Wales authorities in the clean-up of these dead fish along the Darling River? Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Uh, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Davey, for the question. Uh, as Senator Davey is well aware, the Commonwealth is always open to the uh, option of deploying Defence Force personnel to assist uh, in any natural disaster. Uh, if requested by the state government. Now, I am not aware of any request having been made by the New South Wales government for that form of assistance. I'm happy to be corrected if, an, if a, such a request has been made. But of course, the other point to make, out, make is that um, the Menindee Lakes fish deaths, while absolutely tragic, and I think all of us have been very disturbed by the footage there, uh, they do not constitute a natural disaster. Um, so I'm not sure whether there is even the capacity to deploy the defence forces, uh, even if such a request were to occur. Um, if Senator Davey is aware of a request having been made by the defence force, uh, I'm certainly happy to be made aware of that. But I'm certainly not aware of any request having been made. The, um, of course, it's not uncommon for uh, the opposition to call for the deployment of the defence forces, um, despite. Uh, and, and other federal assistance Order. Uh, when not Order. requested by state governments. Uh, we saw Senator Senator's Macdonald do that in a radio interview last week in relation to the floods in northwest Queensland, only a matter of hours after I informed her that no such request had been made by the Queensland government, uh, but never let things get in the way of making a political point when that can be made. Um, the, the, as I say, I think we are all concerned by the large-scale fish kills that are being uh, captured on footage at the moment at Menindee Lakes, and this, is, of course, is the second time in four years that we've seen this occur. Uh, it seems, while this is all being investigated, that it's mostly caused by black water and the low oxygen uh, that results from that. Uh, as the uh, fish kills have been caused by flooding combined with high temperatures, which is what causes that low oxygen that flows from black um, water. Thank you, Minister. What the time for answering has expired. Uh, Senator Davey, wait until you're called. 
Senator Davies. Thank you. Uh, my question, however, Minister, was not necessarily specific to the Defence Force. Uh, and the minister would well be aware that six years um, and fifteen million dollars. Senator Davey, what is the point of order? I wasn't. It was, I'm standing to ask my supplementary question. Okay, sorry. So, uh, Senator Davey, please resume your seat. <laughs> Senator McGrath, that was entirely unnecessary, and I, I am not. It, uh, Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, resume your seat. You are out of order. Sen Senator McGrath. You are out of order. Uh, Minister Farrell. Uh, McGrath deserves a withdrawal and an apology. Absolutely. Senator McGrath, Senator McGrath, resume your seat. You are being disrespectful and disorderly. Senator Farrell has asked you to uh, apologise and withdraw. I'm going to ask you to reflect on that and consider that. I apologise and I withdraw. Thank you, Senator McGrath. Senator, Senator Davey, I'm going to ask you to um, start the question again, and I will apologise because you stood just before the minister had finished, and I thought you were seeking a point of order. So please uh, start again. Thank you. As the minister is well aware, after six years and $15 million spent researching ways to deal with and rem remove large volumes of dead carp from our waterways under the National Carp Control Plan, what are some of the ways that the National Carp Control Plan proposes for large volume dead fish cleanup that could be offered to New South Wales to assist in the current crisis. Thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, Senator Davey. And as I say, uh, I'm not aware of any such request having been made uh, by the New South Wales government to the federal government, but I am aware that our government is working closely with New South Wales authorities in relation uh, to these fish deaths. I also understand that an emergency operations centre has been activated at Menindi to coordinate multi-agency uh, operations. Uh, the centre will ensure fresh and clean water supply is maintained to the Menindi township, as well as to coordinate the removal and disposal of fish. Of course, uh, the, the tragic events that we do see unfolding at Menindi are yet more proof of the need to fully deliver the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, something that the former government was unable to do uh, in all the years. And I know it sets off the gnats, I know it sets off the gnats and it's setting them off again, but after a decade of delay and sabotage by Liberals and Nationals around the country, there is still a way to go to finish the plan. Um, we haven't yet received the full benefits for the river system uh, and unfortunately Minister, this is no proof. The time for answering has expired. Senator Davey, second supplementary. Uh, incredible that you want to flood a flood. But will the Commonwealth be deploying any of the ideas developed under the National Carp Control Program to remove rotting dead fish from the Darling to assist New South Wales in this crisis? That was a program done across jurisdictions, 3,800 pages of document as a result with options for fish cleanup. Have you even looked at it, Minister? Uh, thank you, Senator Davey. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, Senator Davey, not only have I looked at the National Carp Control Plan, but I've in, in particular looked at the fact that it was first announced by the then Minister, Mr Joyce, back in May 2016. It was supposed to be delivered in 2018, and four years later, after the coalition off, lost office, it still hadn't been delivered. Um, so, again, I don't remember this level of outrage around your own government having failed to deliver the National Carp Control Plan that it said would be delivered Order. in 2018. Order. Uh, the CARP plan is complete, although the report that has been received by the government uh, more recently provides insights into the feasibility of the CARP virus as a biocontrol agent, uh, but there are uncertainties about its efficiency and effectiveness in safely removing CARP from our waterways. Uh, and I am surprised that the National Party, uh, being environmental vandals that they are, uh, want to get out there and immediately release a virus uh, into Senator the Murray-Darling River. Senator your seat. But, uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator Davey. I can make a point of order, thank you, Senator Ayres. I can make a point uh, of order, order that he Senator has Davey. just poorly reflected on every member of the National Party. Order. 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 Um, I remind senators, when you seek a point of order, you stand and wait for the call. And If there are interjections from the other side, I will deal with them. Senator Davey, please continue. 
A point of order, thank you, uh, thank Chair. You. Um, point of order is that uh, the minister has um, reflected poorly on every senator in here who is a member of the National Party, calling us environmental vandals. I ask him to withdraw. Thank you. Um, thank you, Senator Davy. In the spirit of uh, keeping the chamber decent and respectful, I will ask Senator Watt to withdraw that comment and to continue his remarks. I withdraw, um, but I am surprised that the National Party wants to uh, just get out there and release the carp virus into the Murray-Darling uh, plan when there are serious concerns uh, about the effects thank that it you, would Minister, have. Thank you, Minister. Your time for answering is expired. Minister uh, Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Sen uh, I uh, request that further questions be placed on the notice thank you. paper. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Uh, in question time on the 9th of March, I took elements of a question asked by Senator Shoebridge to me on notice. I've written to Senator Shoebridge to provide a complete answer, and I now table that answer for the information of the Senate. Thank you. Senator Scar, are you seeking the call? I move to take note of all answers provided by the government in question time today to questions from the opposition. Do you have the call? Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Well, we've heard here today a number of issues canvassed which go to some of the major issues facing uh, this government at this point in time. I want to speak directly in relation to, firstly, forecast gas shortfalls. Now, the Australian energy market opera operator, AEMO, is responsible for managing the electricity and gas systems across the whole of Australia. They're an absolutely integral part of making sure that all the businesses and retail and, and customers, consumers, both business personal across Australia get the electricity and gas they need they need to operate their businesses or to maintain their households. And what that organisation has said, not, not a politician, not a person in this place, but a, but a key organisation in terms of running the electricity and gas system across Australia, They've, in their most recent report they have said, and I quote, they have explicitly named regulatory approvals, price intervention and a mandatory code of conduct, the policies of the government, as, I quote, key uncertainties impacting project timelines and likelihood of completion, end quote, of gas projects. So the policies that were introduced in haste last year, at the end of last year, in mid-December, they called back the whole of parliament to introduce policies which effectively put price controls on the gas industry and would provide the government with the opportunity to dictate the terms and conditions upon which that commodity can be sold and who it can be sold to. As, as, a, direct result of that, as a direct result of that, we now have our key regulator and oversight authority in terms of Australia's electricity and gas system saying that policy, that policy has created key uncertainties impacting project timelines and likelihood of completion. So when those of us on this side of the chamber got up and warned that it was basic economics, basic economics, that price controls, however well intended, invariably impact supply, those opposite were derisive. Were derisive. Said so you don't care about keeping down electricity prices, you don't care about keeping down gas prices. But quite the contrary, Quite the contrary, in terms of the price issue that this country was facing, fundamentally it was a supply issue. This country has enough gas, has enough gas to uh, provide that energy resource to consumers, private consumers and businesses, and plenty more on top of that, and plenty more on top of it. But the policy of the government, the Albanese Labor government, to introduce price controls has had a direct negative impact on those Australians, be they in business or in their homes, relying upon that gas. Now, I can give you an example of a particular project in my home state of Queensland, operated by a Queensland company called Senex, which has been delayed, which has been delayed as a direct result of that price control legislative architecture that was introduced late last year. As a direct result, Senex, a company called Senex, 
which I should say is approximately 50 per cent owned by a Korean organisation called POSCO, which has been investing in Australian resources industry for decades and decades, has delayed $1 billion of spending on a gas project in South West Queensland as a direct result of this policy. Now, those gas reserves, those gas reserves were actually reserved for domestic use. Were reserved for domestic use. And that project, which would produce gas for domestic use, has been delayed as a direct result of the price controls which have been introduced by the Labor government. As a direct result, one billion dollars of investment. And why? Why? They actually tell us why. They say because there's too much uncertainty. How can you invest a billion dollars into a new project if you do not know how much you're going to be able to charge for your product, who you can sell it to, and the terms and conditions of sale? How can you invest? One, I'll say it again. How can you responsibly invest in one billion dollars? Invest one billion dollars in a project where the government can dictate to you the price you can sell it at, who you can sell it to, and the terms and conditions of sale. And you know what? You can go three kilometres north of Australia to Papua New Guinea and invest in their oil and gas industry and not be faced with the same restrictions. So why, why would you invest an extra dollar in this jurisdiction with those price controls when you can invest in one of our nearest neighbours? Senator Ayres. Well, I'm astonished, really. Um, I'm irregularly astonished uh, by the line of argument of those opposite in relation to energy prices. Um, I mean, the first thing, the first thing that people opposite should do uh, in, in any discussion about energy prices, the first thing they should do is apologise. Apologise to the Australian people. Apologise to households. Apologise to business for two things. One is a decade of complete sclerosis, complete inactivity, complete failure on energy prices, complete failure on energy policy. Who can forget 23 different energy policy frameworks and didn't land a single one of them, which contributed to a decade of complete policy uncertainty, frozen investment, billions of dollars worth of investment in Australian energy capability flooded offshore because the rabble over here, when they were on the government benches, couldn't land an energy policy. Like utter failure. And the upward pressure that there is on household and business energy bills is a complete consequence of their failure over here. And the second thing, we'll, we'll come to that in a minute. We'll come to that in a minute. The second thing that Mr. Morrison and Mr. Taylor should apologise for is the fact that immediately prior to the election, the then minister, Mr. Taylor, with his unknown colleague, the secret minister, the then prime minister, were in possession of some knowledge about what was going to happen to wholesale energy prices. Uh, that it was their responsibility to, in the normal course of events, communicate to businesses and households because that's what ministers do. And what did they choose to do? What did Mr Taylor choose to do? He decided to keep that information about price rises in the order of 18 per cent to keep them secret from the Australian people. Why did they do that? Because it didn't suit their political interest. Because as always with Mr Morrison and Mr Taylor and Mr Turnbull and Mr Abbott, their approach to energy was always about glib catchphrases. It was always about slogans. It was all about trying to find division and it was never about, not at any point about, actually trying to encourage investment in, in Australian energy, in distribution, 
I mean, this all this piffle about a gas-led recovery from Mr Morrison, nothing got built, nothing got done. It was just a slogan tested in focus groups that led to no actual investment and no actual action. And you have Senator Scar in here claiming that Labor's, Labor's decision last year in government to intervene to put downward pressure on gas prices and coal prices has somehow led, he says it's economics 101. Well, well, the thing about making that argument is that anybody who's spent time studying economics knows that yes, there is indeed economics 101, but there's second year too, and there's a third year after that, and nobody credible would make an argument to say that price controls today, with investment horizons that far out, is going to lead to uh, supply constraints tomorrow. It's just a silly argument. It's a dishonest argument. It's an argument that's trying to scare people. Well, what does what do the people who are actually what do the people who actually have facts say about this? Well, the Australian Energy Regulator says that energy prices, because of our intervention, are much lower than they otherwise would have been, by a factor of 10 or 20 per cent, much lower. But that doesn't suit the hyper-partisanship and nonsense that we're seeing from the other side on energy prices. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I too rise to take note, uh, particularly the answer from Senator Farrell uh, about Labor's policy on gas. and We've just heard there from Senator Ayres why this government has not got a clue about handling the gas market. They can't just look at the last 3,000 years of economic history and recognise the fact that what they are doing was not going to have a positive impact on the gas market. In fact, was highly likely you could, have, you could have predicted that it would have a negative impact on the gas market. And guess what? Guess what, Senator Cadell? I predicted it. I predicted it. Three weeks before we were recalled to parliament, and you can go back, those opposite who are laughing, go back and look in the West Australian, I wrote an op-ed because this idea of a gas price cap was being floated round by a few low-level Labor ministers, and I thought, no, no, they're not crazy enough to do that. They're not crazy enough to ignore 3,000 years of economic history and impose a price, tap, price cap to try and get gas flowing. They're not that silly. And so I wrote a bit of a what I thought was a tongue-in-cheek op-ed. I wrote what I thought, Senator Cadell, was a tongue-in-cheek op-ed. And it's turned out, three weeks later, we're recalled to parliament to pass gas price caps. And I said in that op-ed, and everybody with a nous of economic sense said at the time, and have said subsequently, that a gas price cap is not going to do what the government says it supposedly wants to do, which is put downward pressure on gas prices and therefore energy prices. In fact, it's done precisely the opposite. Which, which is what I said in my op-ed and what a lot of um, you know, very, very well-trained economists said, because this stuff isn't actually rocket science. There's 3,000 years of economic history going back to ancient Greece that shows that, gas, that price caps of any sort are entirely counterproductive, entirely counterproductive. And what do we have just a few months later when every, anyone with any sense knew that by putting a price cap in place, you'd slow down investment, you'd put a lot of uncertainty in the market, you'd actually increase volatility in the market, and in the end you'd actually put prices up. And guess what we've got from the Australian Energy Regulator's draft default market offer last week? And, and this, this, is, this is frightening. It's, it's not a matter of joking, because this impacts household power bills. It impacts on small businesses. Uh, now, mostly in the East Coast, I'll say a little bit more about that later, but uh, it impacts on small businesses throughout the national energy market. Uh, what, what, is the, what has the, um, the Australian 
uh, regulator said about the default market offer. Electricity price rises, electricity price rises in South Australia, New South Wales and South East Queensland for around 24 per cent. 24 per cent. In Victoria, 31 per cent. 31 per cent. That's, that's a doubling every three years. 31 per cent increase in one year. And this is at the same time when those same families, those same small businesses, aren't just being hit with massive spikes in their energy, price, energy prices, they're also being hit by massive spikes in the cost of their borrowings. A lot of small businesses need to run an overdraft. They need to, to run debt in order to operate. And we've seen the fastest rise in interest rates pretty much in the history of Australia. Uh, families have seen their mortgage repayments go up by, in many cases, uh, $1,000 a month. And this has a real direct impact on Australian families and Australian businesses. And, and those, those opposite think that it's a joke, thinks it's a joke to recall Parliament and pass legislation to impose price caps for a, for a political sugar hit to be seen to be doing something when in actual fact they knew it would be entirely counterproductive if they were being at all honest with themselves. Uh, in Western Australia we're a little lucky. We're a little lucky. We have a large um, domestic gas availability and obviously we export the vast majority of Australia's gas. And that's thanks to the court government's decision in the 1970s. Senator Stewart. Thank you, Deputy President. I am also astounded at those opposite and their claim to care about some of the most vulnerable people in our community and, and their talk for caring about the cost of living and the impact that has on Australians. Because the Australian people have inherited a trillion dollars of debt. The Australian taxpayer has inherited a trillion dollars of debt. We're now experiencing a cost of living crisis, and those opposite have showed their true colours. They don't care about the people who are experiencing the full brunt of the cost of living crisis that we've got in our country. They've spent the last couple of weeks advocating for 0.5 per cent of the population with over $3 million in their superannuation balances. 0.5 per cent with over $3 million in their superannuation balances. They want to advocate for 17 people, I think what it is, with over $300 million. But actually the people who are doing it tough are uh, the people on the ground. It's something like around 10 nurses that would be needed to pay for somebody's superannuation balance with, for, with over $3 million in it. They think it's okay for nurses to pay for the superannuation balances that have over $3 million in them. And then to the point of energy. It is so rich for those opposite to get up and talk about energy prices in this country. I just want to talk about a couple of, a couple of legacy pieces of, of those opposite. They voted against a saving to household power bills. They changed the laws to hide a 20 per cent increase in the default electricity offer. In nine years, nine years, almost a decade, 22 energy policies and not a single one of them worked. Not a single one. 22 policies ignored over 12 warnings from the ACCC and IAMO about domestic gas supply. They're talking about gas. How's this for a fact? No new gas basins opened up under them. Under them, we saw a four gigawatt in dispatchable power leave and only one gigawatt came in. That, there's, there's some facts for you, but sure, like we're still continuing to have some denial in this chamber. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. We've got a responsible plan to try and tackle some of the challenges that we've inherited as a government. 
It's about relief, repair and restraint. Responsible cost of living relief, like cheaper childcare, cheaper medicine, direct energy bill relief even, repairing supply side constraints, like fee-free fee TAFE, cleaner and cheaper energy, national reconstruction fund and more affordable housing. Responsible budget with spending restraint, returning almost all revenue upgrades to the bottom line and keeping spending essentially flat over the next four years to not add to inflation. So I want to just repeat that. Spending flat, not wages like the policy of those opposite. Spending flat and we're not keeping wages flat. Australians understand that we didn't create these challenges, but they elected us to take responsibility for them. Our actions on the cost of living are there for people to see. I just want to spell them out. We successfully argued for a Fair Work Commission minimum wage to, incre to increase in line with inflation. We've introduced legislation that would drive investment in cleaner and cheaper energy, putting downward pressure on power prices. The May budget will include direct energy bill relief for households and businesses, which, which the opposition tried to block. We're delivering cheaper childcare. We're delivering cheaper medicines. We're delivering fee-free TAFE and more university places. We're expanding paid parental leave. We are building more affordable homes, including through the new National Housing Accord. Pensions, allowances and rent assistance have increased in line with inflation. We've brought in a new pension and work bonus so older Australians can keep more of what they earn without affecting their pension. We are on the side of all Australians. They are on the side of 0.5 per cent of Australians. Senator Van. Thank you, Deputy Chair. And I rise to take note of questions from Senator Ciccone and I think it was Stuart about AUKUS. Uh, Sorry? That, uh, the, the, motion which, the motion that was moved uh, by Senator Scar did not include the response to that question, so it would be all the other questions. No you problem can speak at to. all. I can happily switch to the other one. <laughs> not the wrong pack. I got two. I'm good at both. Deputy President, on energy policy, it has become very apparent that this government does not and cannot deliver on its promises. Those opposite, after almost a decade in opposition, obviously forgot how to govern and that in government actions must be taken to deliver results. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just about to. The, the AUKUS ones that we announced. Senator Van, Senator Shubri, Senator Stewart, it's not a conversation through me, Senator Van. Thank you. I'm about to tell him. I'm looking forward I tried to before. Because right now the reality under the, Alba reality under the Albanese Labor government is Australians are far worse off and only going to be worse so later this year when the energy prices go up. Now they were always were on the hustings out there saying you know, we're going to lower energy prices. Energy prices will be lowered by $275. We've heard how many times Prime Minister Albanese promised that. We know that's not happened, and we heard this week again prices are going up. And not only are they going up, there's going to be shortfalls of gas this winter. Why? Again, because of the policies on the other side. It doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah, because your Andrews government had a moratorium on them. That's why. And when they knew that they would not be able to fulfil their promise of cutting power bills by $275, they promised an, an assistance package would be finalised in March, with support expected to flow from April. However, again, surprise, surprise, they have broken that promise and not delivered the financial support that they, were, that they promised on a timeline that they set to help people with a rising energy cost crisis that they have caused. And the truth is, we knew higher prices, power prices would come with this government's ill-thought-out, illogical and, frankly, quite ridiculous energy plan. Now, to be clear, I'm very supportive of the transition, transition to a net-zero economy, and I believe it should be more ambitious 
than what this government has set for their Paris target. And when I attended COP27 in Egypt last year, one thing was abundantly clear, that whether you like it or not, transition to renewables is happening, so that anyone not on board will be in front of this tidal wave of investment, regulation and finance will be swept away. However, it is lucky only a few Labor members attended, because if they had been there, if they had had a strong presence, they would have been laughed out of the place if they presented their plan to get to 43 per cent. In the best of conditions, this transition is going to be long and is going to be hard and is going to be expensive. Given that, we don't have a dollar or a day to waste. What we need to is this government to not make energy more costly and harder on Australians than it has to be. Yet, despite the Albanese government repeatedly blaming the Ukraine invasion and coalition policy to explain Australia's steadily rising power bills, the impact of the current proposed policy is foundational to the uncertain future of domestic energy prices, decarbonisation and the required investment. This reason, the government's reasoning behind energy crisis due to the global impact of Russia's illegal invasion. However, it is more important to note that the ACCC reported the net back price of LNG was at $41 per gigajoule before the, the, uh, the events in Ukraine. This issue has been prevalent globally in, and in Australia for a decade due to a lack of investment in new supply. In fact, JP Morgan's 2020 annual energy paper explicitly states that countries can reduce production of fossil fuels um, under, the, that, under the assumption that renewables can quickly replace and face substantial and economic geopolitical risk. If the transition is to succeed, we cannot disconnect the generations we have before we have time to replace it. We know under this government that power prices are going to re remain high. That's just a fact, and that will be their failure. I put the question, moved by Senator Scar, those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Senator Shoebridge. Uh, Deputy President, I rise to take note to the answers given by the Honourable Don Farrell to both Senator McKim and myself. And Senator Gallagher, and the answer given by Senator Gallagher as well to Senator McKim. You have the call. Um, it's now 20 years since Iraq was illegally invaded, an invasion that was predicated on a lie, that was sold to the world by the United States and the United Kingdom, and it was a lie that our government accepted at face value, never testing, never bringing to this parliament, never putting to the Australian people, and it's a lie that has produced a brutal war, the effects of which are still being felt 20 years on. And those, those effects are being particularly felt, felt by the people of Iraq. There were some 7,000 Iraqi civilians killed in just the first two months of the shock and awe campaign, as it was described. Some 500,000 Iraqis have lost their lives since. Um, and millions of Iraqis remain displaced, many refugees in their own country, all for a war based on a lie where we followed the United States like a little loyal poodle into the war. And has this government learnt those, the lessons of that war? Well, obviously not. First of all, this government joined with the coalition to refuse to release the documents about the decision-making leading us into that war, to continue the secrecy of the coalition under the new Albanese government. But then in this last week, we have seen just how little Labor has learnt from history, because they have committed us to a $368 billion plus nuclear submarine package with the United States and the United Kingdom, the two countries who peddled those wars that dragged us into the, those lies that dragged us into the war with Iraq. They've signed us on to a 30-year, $368 plus billion dollar nuclear submarines program, which will inevitably drag us into the United States next war. Because that's the purpose. It's to tie the Australian military and the Australian people um, intimately into the United States military. Because these are subs we can't build, we can't crew, we can't operate, and we won't be able to deploy without the express consent of the United States. That isn't about defending Australia. It's about projecting force well from our shores into the South China Sea 
as, as a loyal subunit of the United States military. And the lie that is repeatedly told by the Albanese government peddling the cooked up, reheated coalition policy that this is about defending Australia, that lie has been learnt by millions of Australians as we speak. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. While people are getting smashed by a cost of living prices, crisis, Labor is proceeding with a quarter of a trillion dollars worth of stage three tax cuts for the top end and a grotesque $360 billion commitment to nuclear powered submarines. And I want to issue a challenge to every single Labor Party senator in this place. Go back to your communities and tell the people who are living in those communities how proud you are of your priorities. Go and tell a worker whose real wages are going backwards at the fastest rate on record how much you and Gina Reinhart need that $9,000 a year tax cut. Go and tell the woman in her 60s sleeping on her friend's couch how you can't afford a house for her to live in. Go and tell the person starving on JobSeeker how the weapons manufacturers need public money far more than they do. Go and tell the parents who can't afford to fix their kids' teeth how you can't afford to make it any easier for them to go to the dentist. But you won't. You won't, will you? Because you believe in austerity for the poor, in tax cuts for the wealthy and blank checks for the military industrial complex. The fact that both major parties are now supportive of Labor's stage three tax cuts for the top end and Labor's $360 billion commitment to nuclear submarines means that you will never criticise each other for those decisions. But I can tell you one thing, the Australian Greens will line up to criticise you and we will do it every day because we want to be able to look people in the eye and say, actually, we can afford to put dental and mental into Medicare. We can afford to wipe student debt. We can afford to make childcare free. We can afford to raise income support. And the reason that we can afford to do that is because we should not be proceeding with the AUKUS nuclear sub-deal and we should not be proceeding with the stage three tax cuts. Poverty is a political choice and it's being made by the major parties in this place every day. I put the question as moved by Senator Shoebridge. Those for the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it.